Did you know? When localizing Shovel Knight for Japan, Yacht Club Games wanted to recreate some of the differences between Eastern and Western versions of games during the NES era. This included small changes like adding Japanese text to the title screen, making some of the game's coins resemble yen, changing character avatars to be more anime-like, and giving Shovel Knight a snooze bubble when he sleeps. Since the Famicom's disc system add-on had superior tech over the NES, the team wanted the Japanese version to reflect this. Yacht Club Games had to improve and add several animations to illustrate this. This included more frames for the dragon whelps, animating the grass and the plains, and adding animated water for the village fountain. The team also included a few extra secrets in the Japanese version. When the player visits Gastronomer to upgrade their health, he'll randomly sometimes serve up some onigiri. The game's cheats also have different effects such as carrots being replaced by daikon radishes, and gold coins rotating to better resemble a koban style coin. This level of dedication is typical of Yacht Club games and can be seen throughout the team's history. The company was founded by a group of ex -way forward employees who wanted to keep making games together in a close-knit group. Typically, when a project at WayForward ended, teams split up and spread to other teams to lend additional support. However, some of the developers wanted to keep working with colleagues they built a relationship with, leading them to break away from WayForward and found their own studio. The initial idea for Shovel Knight was conceived in January of 2013, in what artist Nick Wozniak described as a joke conversation over lunch that kind of got too serious. The six-man team were set on making a title in the style of an NES game, and one that would be themed around a central mechanic. Mechanic. They thought about game mechanics they liked, and one that came up was the downward thrust found in Zelda 2, as it covered a lot of ground by being both a jumping and attacking maneuver. A few ideas came from this concept, including the player hitting enemies from above, flipping enemies over to expose weak points, and digging through blocks. These ideas didn't really fit the motif of a sword, so one team member suggested they have a knight character who carried a shovel, and the name Shovel Knight came not long after that. Two months later, the team took their game to Kickstarter, with the campaign launching March 14th. On March 19th, it was announced the game would come to the Nintendo 3DS and Wii U. This was due to the efforts of Dan Adelman, former head of Nintendo of America's indie program. During Nintendo's early days of digital game distribution, there were no plans in place to release all new titles, much less from indie developers. However, Adelman saw the potential in giving indie devs a space on Nintendo platforms and spearheaded the WiiWare and DSiWare services. Nintendo were more willing to play ball with indie developers when the Wii U struggled with third-party support. Adelman previously previously worked with Yacht Club's Sean Velasco during his days at Way Forward, and when the team got in touch with him before the Kickstarter went live, he had complete trust in them, and they were quickly approved. Yacht Club has said if not for Dan, Shovel Knight would have never made it to a Nintendo system, and it's possible the game would have never been funded in the first place. Upon the game's launch, Yacht Club divided their workload between Kickstarter and making a playable demo for the game. Yacht Club would attend PAX East on March 22nd, and Velasco recalled how nervous the team was about not having anything to show at the event, saying, I remember thinking even a week before PAX, well, maybe we won't be able to get a demo done, and we'll just have our banner there, and some beanbags, and Super Mario 64, and we'll just play it and tell people about the game even though there's no game to play. Fortunately, we were able to get it all done. The demo was received with positivity and was showcased by a popular gaming channel such as The Game Grumps and Super Best Friends Play. Shovel Knight had a crowdfunding goal of $75,000, which it easily reached by March 30th. Even when the campaign concluded on April 14th, it managed to raise over $300,000 from nearly 15,000 backers. One aspect of the game that the team were worried about was the difficulty scale. Members of Yacht Club worked on Blood Rain Betrayal at Way Forward and recalled how many people hated the game for its brutally frustrating difficulty. They did not want a repeat situation situation on their hands, so one feature they tinkered with was a checkpoint system. It started out similar to the ones found in the Mega Man games, being invisible with no clear indication. The team later decided they wanted something physical, and tested having clear checkpoints throughout the level. They still found the game to be too easy with checkpoints in place, so they thought about charging the players for using one. As the game centered around money, paying for a checkpoint added more value to it, and gave players the choice of when and where to save. However, they realized if a more inexperienced player wasn't able to collect enough money to pay for one, their frustration would only be exacerbated. So they turned this completely on its head and had players earn gold for deactivating a checkpoint. Elements of a story were fairly light at the time, with the idea being that Shovel Knight had a shovel and, at the end of the game, would bury his wife. Still, the idea of making something heartwarming with somber moments had been in their thoughts from the start. The bonfire segments between stages were a key visual conceived even before the gameplay was finalized, and is where Shield Knight eventually came into being. She initially started out as something for the player 
player to go after, even being referred to as Princess MacGuffin by the team. An early sprite of her still exists in the game's data, simply labeled Princess. However, they decided to incorporate the bonfire imagery with Shovel Knight's attempts at saving somebody. Velasco imagined Shovel Knight reliving a nightmare over and over, failing to save Shield Knight. Making these segments playable also helped the player become more invested in Shovel Knight's dilemma. While Shovel Knight was made to emulate the look of an NES game, it didn't shy away from the advances made with modern consoles. The team didn't dedicate themselves to replicating the NES capabilities perfectly, and broke limitations they felt would interfere with the gameplay. Sprite flickering, which occurred when the NES displayed more than 8 sprite tiles per horizontal line, was omitted. The team kept the sprite count as low as possible, but did not stress over it, especially when it came to making things a bit more flashy. When it came to animations, at times they would remove frames, and in other places they would leave it as is. One example noted by Velasco was with Spectre Knight, who had elaborate movements they found to look completely natural. Shovel Knight also has multiple layers of background parallax scrolling, a feature that lets a game slide background elements at different speeds, often used to create an illusion of depth. While the technique was common on the Super Nintendo, it was rare on the NES. It could only be done with careful planning. As an added bonus, this direction allowed them to take advantage of the stereoscopic 3D effects of the Nintendo 3DS hardware. Sticking to the NES's strict palette of 54 colors presented some challenges as well. A few extra colors were added to the mix, including different skin tones to diversify the in-game cast, as well as the various backers who had their likeness featured in the Hall of Champions. For Polar Knight, a shade of beige was added to his skin and cloak. This color isn't used for anything else in the game, and was originally a placeholder, but it was left alone when the team couldn't find something better. The team also discarded the limitation that forced sprites to share color palettes. On the NES, if a sprite changed color, all other sprites used and the same colors would change accordingly as they're sharing the same palette information. Yacht Club did, however, use limited palettes for enemy damage and explosion effects. The NES was also unable to display large sprites. Large enemies and bosses on the NES often didn't move, as they were mostly made up of background tiles. This was done to get around the system's harsh sprite limitations, but came at the cost of making bosses almost entirely stationary. While the team liked the impact NES bosses had as a result of this, they opted to just make larger sprites and have fewer restrictions. Actions. Expansions for the game were planned during the crowdfunding period. At the time, the stretch goals were simply labeled as Playable Boss Knight 1, 2, and 3. These expansions originally had players go through the same game as one of the order of no quarter, with some minor changes to the gameplay and story. Work began for Plague of Shadows before the base game released, and the team compared it to Richter mode in Castlevania Symphony of the Night. However, the team thought it would be weird for Plague Knight to be traversing in the world with all the dialogue being the exact same as the original game. They also felt it would be disappointing if the two knights played identically, and began adding more features and alternative routes as well as a new narrative. Though the scope expanded, all the expansions remained totally free. Yacht Club found this helped to advertise the game, inspiring fans to buy the game again on other platforms or buy it for their friends. The game also featured a renowned butt mode, where most nouns in the game's text are replaced with the word but this was the final goal for Shovel Knight's Kickstarter, coming about on the final day. As the game had hit every stretch goal possible, the team was concerned about adding any more, fearing they'd never get the game done if they did. Someone suggested butt mode to be the next goal, and when asked what that was, the person kept it a secret. Somewhat like Shovel Knight itself, it started out as something that was supposed to be a joke that got a little too serious, with Velasco saying, we didn't even know what it was going to be in the beginning, but we thought no matter what it was, we had to put it in butt mode. Then one day, Dan D'Angelo, our programmer, said, butt mode is in. Truly inspiring. Another interesting secret can be found in the game's second campaign, Shovel Knight Plague of Shadows. If the player is unwilling to fight Plague of Shadows and simply stands still during the fight, the encounter will end after about 40 seconds without the player taking a hit. The boss seems to give up and the player continues to the next area. Did you also know that in the German version of Super Smash Bros. Melee, Popo's name was changed to Pepe because Popo means butt in German? Or that Battlefield 1942 was originally going to be a GameCube exclusive? For more facts, check out the Digino Gaming video on GameCube secrets and censorship. And if you're already subscribed to Digino Gaming, consider Boundary Break the peanut butter to this show's jelly. You want to see a video game in a perspective you've never seen before, make sure you check out Boundary Break in this link here. I was actually very fortunate to be able to collect with the developers themselves to make a very special Shovel Knight episode, so I hope you check it out. Take care, guys.